thank you very much, um, Sam, for the for the introduction and also for inviting me uh, to come and talk to you today about uh, uh, which a little bit about my my journey into uh, the frogs that I've been uh, that I've been working on, and, and hopefully some of that um, will become clear, and there'll be a, uh, maybe a take home message or two. Uh, that might be uh, uh, well. I won't go uh, go as far as to say inspiring, but it might be encouraging uh, with a bit of luck, and, and hopefully you'll you'll learn something new um, along the way. So, um, first of all, I uh, would like to reiterate my uh, my thanks to Sam and Bristol Zoological Society for inviting me to come and talk uh, today. Um, but I tend to start my uh, my lectures uh, and my talks with acknowledgements. Um, the, there's lots of people and organisations that are involved in the work that you undertake when you're doing uh, field research conservation work and without them um, you wouldn't be able to do that work so instrumental in uh, in the work that I've been doing for the past uh, 10 or so years, DICE, University of Kent, MBZ, Seychelles Islands Foundation, Institute of Zoology, um, Royal Society of Bi Biology, uh, Darwin Initiative, and lots of other uh, organisations and, uh, and people have been involved in that. So uh, thank you very much uh, to them. So uh, an outline of uh, what we're going to cover uh, today, it's kind of in, in three parts. Uh, first is how it started. And how it started is uh, really how all the best natural history stories should really start. And that's with an important natural historian in my case, uh, it was David Attenborough. So I sent Dave, as I like to call him, uh, a letter with some pictures that I'd, that I'd uh, drawn when uh, when I was about, um, about eight years old, I think. Eight or nine years old. Life on Earth had just come on the telly. Um, and uh, I'd just like to point out that uh, David Attenborough thinks that my drawings are excellent. So that's the first uh, take, a really important take home message for you. Uh, from, uh, from my, my lecture today, from my talk today. So this uh, spurred me on. Uh, so not, not, not that far uh, after my uh, encouragement from, from Dave, um, I invented the scientific poster, which you can see uh, on the screen here. Um, it's uh, my, my first attempt at describing the natural history of, uh, of the marsh frog, uh, an introduced species in the UK. So we'll sort of put that, uh, put that to the side for the moment. Um, so that's kind of how it started. And then where we are now approximately is, is how it's going. And there's uh, a picture of me diving into uh, and out of uh, a cave uh, on Silhouette Island in Seychelles, um, holding uh, a frog uh, in my hand. Um, but it's kind of the stuff in the middle and, and the journey that it's taken uh, to, to get there. Uh, as well as some of the uh, leading into some of the, the some of the scientific uh, work that I've been able to do since that, um, or in between how it started and how it's going, that, that I'm going to kind of walk you through, uh, walk you through now. So it kind of looks like everything started all right and everything's going all right at the moment, but and it did kind of all start all right and it is going pretty well at the moment, um, but appearances can be deceptive. So I'm going to start possibly, uh, I don't know how many uh, uh, scientific talks you might have seen which uh, exhibit school reports, but I've, I'm, I'm going to brave my uh, <laughs> a selection of my school reports. So um, this is from, uh, from music. Uh, James can be very silly at times and does not work to his full capacity. I hope for better efforts next term. So yeah, not really ideal. When James turns, this is for English, I think, yeah, when James turns up to my lessons, he tells me how he's going to catch up. He is now 10, 500 words essays behind. Who is he trying to fool? So maybe you get kind of getting the, the, the feeling that uh, my, uh, my schooling and my, my experience at school and my, uh, my input into school wasn't possibly as, as good as maybe Dave might have, have, have hoped for. And unfortunately, you can see from my uh, uh, one of my early school reports that science really wasn't uh, wasn't that great. So, yeah, a little, little bit of a concern. It did get slightly better, uh, although not before uh, I received uh, the uh, the diagnosis of possible terminal idleness. Um, a low point. Uh, you, you, you could possibly uh, possibly agree. Um, but 
there are some 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 glimmering signs of hope here. So uh, James has uh, made good progress in this subject in both written and practical aspects. I think this was for CDT, craft design and technology. And my flat cap at the time was very much admired. So I was quite happy about that. Um, but possibly my best, uh, best feedback I got was uh, for music. I'm very pleased with the amount of effort James has put in this term. Well done. So mixed, I think, is possibly uh, at best is the, is the take home uh, from all of that. And possibly the, the best thing that I left, uh, left school with or the thing which I uh, left with of which I'm most proud is my individual competition certificate for uh, being a champion in the long jump final, 4.47 metres, which I'm sure you will all agree is uh, quite some distance. But even when I did get something right, managed to succeed, they still managed to spell my name wrong. Um, but okay, it was it was a long time ago. Well, I'm going to let them off for that. So now we're on to how how things went. So stuff in the middle, um, or continuing with how stuff uh, uh, how stuff in the middle went. So this is me, about sixteen years old. I just left home. Uh, I was actually working on the railway. Uh, I was working in ticket offices at Waterloo and Charing Cross and London Bridge and actually ended up compiling the duty rota for station staff. So all the people that you see uh, on the platforms. Um, but as life goals go, uh, possibly working on the railway wasn't my target, especially after that inspiration from uh, from Dave, which is but it wasn't happening for me at that at that point. Uh, science wasn't uh, was, wasn't at the forefront of my forefront of my plans. This is kind of where the sounds uh, aspect of my uh, my talk today comes in. So sounds are rather music. So um, a reminder of my uh, my best school report. I'm very pleased with the amount of effort James has put in this term. Well done. So music. This is what I ended up doing. So uh, two things I wanted to do when I was a kid. One was be David Attenborough, which obviously didn't happen. Um, or a paleontologist, which obviously did, didn't happen. And the other was to, uh, was to be a DJ. So uh, I wasn't doing, doing the scientific work. So yeah, I ended up, um, I ended up DJing. So this is, um, is me DJing in the bar in the Ministry of Sound sometime in the ooh, 90s at some point. Another club in London. This is a game for, uh, for Ministry of Sound. And I was, I was yeah, playing all over the place. So, and also promoting uh, nights. Uh, at Ministry of Sound in London. I was resident for, for this club night at uh, DTPM in, in Fabric for a few years. I was DJing all over the all over the UK, Spain, India, um, Lithuania, uh, all over the shop. But I became, after a while, a little bit jaded with hanging around in nightclubs. Um, and in 2007, I had, I guess you could describe it as a bit of a midlife crisis. And I I couldn't actually do the usual bloke thing and uh, go and buy a motorbike, basically because I already had a motorbike and I couldn't afford to get another motorbike. And so cutting a longer story short, um, after realising that it was a viable option, I decided to, um, to go back to school. Uh, and I did that by undertaking uh, a, uh, an undergraduate degree at DICE at the University of Kent in the School of Anthropology and Conservation um, in wildlife conservation. So uh, I went from this to this, uh, and I finished my my BSc in uh, in 2011. So um, a little over 10 years ago, which is also the same time that I post uh, I started my postgrad studies, uh, which is also at Dice, which ultimately led into uh, uh, becoming in, uh, becoming my my PhD. Also important to note here that um, I still apparently use the same. Uh, facial expressions, um, even years apart, this doesn't seem to uh, doesn't seem to make any difference. Although here I am decidedly trying to do uh, a Les Dawson uh, impersonation. For those of you who uh, who may know who Les Les Dawson is, uh, if you don't, um, ask your grandparents perhaps. Um, also, another important thing to note here is I still have this T-shirt. Um, it's got lots of holes in it, um, but uh, uh, I use this for uh, for field work for for a, a long, long time, and it's still uh, knocking about in uh, in my wardrobe. So now moving on to the more scientific aspects of how it went, all the stuff in the middle, and, and the research that I did in 
uh, in social. So the, 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 my PhD stories begins like all good stories a long time ago in a land far, far away, uh, about 8,000 miles away to be exact. So Seychelles in the Western Indian Ocean, uh, and in particular, the inner, uh, inner islands, um, the Granitic Islands, they have a long evolutionary history. So the inner islands that we see today are in fact the elevated sections of a former microcontinent that currently sits about 50 meters below um, sea level. And this microcontinent was part once part of Gondwana. And when Gondwana broke up, as you just saw um, in the graphic here, um, it was attached to the Indian um, subcontinent, which then broke away um, from Gondwana. And then about 63 million years ago, uh, India continued on its northward journey towards um, Asia, um, um, banging into uh, the, uh, the Eurasian continent uh, about 50 million years ago. So the inner islands of the Seychelles, um, the granitic sections, which are still emergent, um, have many characteristics um, of what might be described as regular oceanic islands in terms of island biogeography theory. Uh, but given their origin uh, and never having been fully submerged, they retained at least some deep time vicariant taxa, uh, including amphibians, as we shall see. Um, and it makes these islands a, a really ideal closed system in which to study uh, evolutionary biology. So the Seychelles is uh, the location in which I spent a great deal of my uh, research career and on uh, Mahe, uh, Silhouette and Pralin uh, in particular. And as you can probably well imagine, it was a hellish place uh, in which to work. Um, as can be clearly illustrated uh, from the uh, from the image uh, from the image here, terrible, terrible, terrible place. Don't go. However, you do have to climb things like this in order to be able to actually get uh, get any work done. Um, so there's a lot of uh, a lot of physical effort uh, involved. But it's uh, it's always nice to uh, to go down to those nice situations by the uh, by the by by the beach. Um, after a long day clambering up a mountain with uh, yeah, with a nice cold sabre. So one of the things that uh, we were really interested in, in, in looking at is the biogeographic patterns in the amphibian fauna and also uh, uh, how these relate to patterns that we see uh, in other fauna on Seychelles, so other um, potentially deep time vicariant forms. So, uh, so the ancestors of lineages that have been on the inner islands um, since it broke up, since it uh, split from the Indian subcontinent. And what we've seen in uh, in uh, with some some species that there uh, can be a north south split. Uh, there could be uh, an island specific um, population which is uh, genetically distinct from another population. Um, and sometimes the, the splits can be um, separating islands as well as having this, this north-south split. And what we were interested in finding out um, was what this pattern might be um, with a particular group of frogs uh, known as uh, zooglossids. So zooglossids, the zooglossidae, are uh, a family which are, are endemic to an, to an archipelago. There's only uh, two uh, anurin families which are endemic to, to archipelagos globally and, and zooglossids are, are one of those and this family is uh, comprised of two genera and uh, in each genus there are two species. Um, they are fully terrestrial so there's no waterborne tadpole stage um, and then on the uh, oh, sorry I haven't, I haven't clicked to the uh, there we go that's that's better so I can show you what the um, yeah, what the what the offspring look like. So they're fully uh, fully terrestrial, no waterborne um, tadpole stage. Uh, and what you can see here um, is lots of uh, lots of offspring are actually on the back of this uh, on the back of this uh, Zyglossus sechelensis. So what what happens is the um, the male calls from underneath uh, vegetation, uh, and uh, female hops along. If she likes the sound of the male's uh, male's calls, uh, they'll do their their, their froggy business, and um, the eggs are deposited on the ground, so they don't go into into water um, at all. So the eggs are deposited in the ground. They undergo uh, development within the egg. The tadpoles hatch out of the egg, and then actually climb onto 
um, onto the back uh, of the female. And what we can see here are one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, seven, I think, um, young frogs, which are on the back of this uh, female, uh, female Seshalensis. So in this frog, this, the larger frog, this female here, um, is probably about um, 1.5 centimetres long, um, no more than that. The maximum snout vent length they get is about two centimetres. So more often than not, uh, they're about a centimetre, a uh, centimetre and a half long. Um, and what we think happens is that the, there's some kind of um, chemical uh, response or trigger which, in, which initiates the um, either the frogs to encourage the tadpoles to crawl uh, on the on the on the back of the adult, or for the uh, tadpoles themselves to actually exit the egg and then crawl onto the back of the on, onto the back of the adult. We don't really know the actual uh, response mechanisms and, and key mechanisms that happen there, but the tadpoles go onto the back of the on the back of the adult and then they uh, they remain on the back of the female as she pops off to do her, her regular froggy stuff, and then they grow. Uh, and develop until they're either uh, dislodged or kicked off uh, by the female, as we can see, as we can see here. So my my PhD work focused really on this particular species. So um, Zyglossus sechulensis. There are um, other species um, which also form part of my uh, part of my study. So uh, Zyglossus thomasetti, which is a much larger frog. Um, Sechulophrine gardeneri here, which until uh, not that long ago was actually thought to be one of the, uh, if not the smallest terrestrial vertebrates. So snout vent length of sometimes even less than a less than a centimeter, and they have a sister species, um, Sechelophrine uh, pipula dryas, which uh, which is found only on the island uh, of Silhouette. So my my PhD work was on on Zyglossidae, as I said, but with a strong focus on Zyglossus sechelensis. Um, reason being. Um, in 2009, uh, there was a population of this frog found on the island of Pralin. So previous to this, um, no zyglossids had been detected on Pralin. So, so that raised a lot of, uh, a lot of questions. Um, how did they get there? Why had they not been detected? Had anyone actually looked for them there? Were they a recent introduction? Um, and stemming from that, what is the relationship between these frogs? Uh, and Zyglossus sechelensis on other islands. So, so sechelensis is known from Mahe and Silhouette. Tomasetti is also known from Mahe and Silhouette. Gardeneri is known from Mahe and Silhouette. And as I've said, uh, Pipula dryas is only known from Silhouette. But now we have this population of sechelensis on, on Pralin. So what, what's going on with them? What, how did they get there? What's the, what's the situation? What are the relationships between these frogs? and other Seychellensis populations uh, and other populations um, or other island populations of these glossids. So I collected uh, a whole load of uh, frog toes. So this is me uh, with the last frog that I collected as part of my PhD research uh, in 2013. Uh, and then this was uh, combined with um, lots of lab work, which as you will recognize from this, somewhat jaded image of me, uh, lab work often uh, results uh, in faces like this. Um, any of you who've done work in the lab uh, will, will, uh, will know what this, uh, what this feeling, this, this feeling that I'm emoting from the image here looks like. You try things and they don't work. So you spend a lot of time in the lab trying to get things to work. And I definitely didn't spend weeks on end trying to work out why my reactions weren't producing results only to realize that I had not included uh, and it's an essential ingredient of uh, some of the uh, some of the chemical reactions that I needed to do to get the DNA uh, analysis. No, nope, I definitely didn't waste lots of my supervisor's money uh, trying to do that by making a really rookie error. Um, anyway, the less said uh, about that, the better. Um, but lab work is always made much better and easier by the people that you work with. And this is uh, my one of my supervisors, uh, Jim Groombridge. Some of you may be familiar uh, with him and, uh, uh, and his work. Um, so stress in the lab is always made a lot easier by people that you work with and, and yeah, really good, uh, good bunch of people. Um, uh, and uh, much fun was had by all in between the, the depressed faces in the lab when things sometimes didn't work, but we helped each other out. 
So what did we find out about the evolutionary relationships of the zooglossids? So we're now on to um, how it's going. So the closest ancestor of zooglossid frogs uh, are the Nazgabatrachidae from the eastern and western Ghats of India. So thinking back to the graphic that you saw earlier, when India was breaking away from uh, from Gondwana and then the rest of the breakup was happening and then India continued on until um, uh, um, hitting, uh, the, hitting Laurasia uh, about 50 million years ago. These frogs, some of you might have seen images of these, so purple balloon frogs are sometimes referred to, are the closest known ancestor um, of the zooglossids. Um, which also again cements their their real real ancient lineage as being Gondwan and uh, ancestors of, of Gondwan and uh, origin um, and urines. And they're thought to have div um, uh, diverged from um, uh, zooglossids are thought to have diverged from the Nazgabatrachids about sixty six million years ago. Um, so just as a bit of a recap, important to remember here that there are no other zooglossid frogs on Pralin. And that they are only found on two other islands, so Mahe and Silhouette. So the main questions that I was looking to answer were based around um, what is the relationship between praline frogs and frogs on these other two islands? And I'll, I'll briefly express, uh, explain uh, what, the, uh, what the images here represent for you. So ultimately, I found out that um, the frogs from each island uh, were an evolutionarily significant unit. So all of the silhouette frogs, when I was looking at their DNA, all of the silhouette frogs uh, for Sechelensis cluster together. All of the, uh, the, the Sechelensis frogs on Pralin cluster together. All of the Sechelensis frogs on Mahe also all cluster together in one clade. So each, each, uh, each other's sister, but all in one clade and all very distinct. So no, no mixing. Uh, in terms of uh, the DNA here between these different populations. I also found from looking, from including uh, Tomasetti Gardineri uh, in the study that Mahe populations of Tomasetti uh, were also grouped together. Silhouette populations of Tomasetti uh, were also grouped together and the same again for Gardineri on Silhouette and Mahe. So all of these frogs have very distinct island specific lineages so each each of them has each currently recognized species has its own island specific um, population so each island has its own distinct lineage so in this this data was preliminary uh, was primarily driven by uh, mitochondrial dna uh, but when we looked at patterns in nuclear dna um, especially looking at haplotypes while less clear we did also find um, that there are strong indications of multiple island specific uh, haplotypes, so island specific characteristics in the nuclear DNA, um, which were unique to those given islands. And that's what you can see here represented by, uh, by the colours and the colours uh, represent the same lineages uh, that you can see in the, uh, in the phylogeny here. And when we did some further work looking at um, uh, 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 what's called um, using multi-species uh, coalescent approach, um, we looked at separate analyses of mitochondrial and nuclear DNA, and we got broadly similar results. And, and this information um, supported overall what we were getting from, uh, from a phylogeny based on mitochondrial DNA, and also the patterns that we were seeing in haplotypes. Uh, and this material was published uh, in 2019, and there's some information uh, for you at the bottom, uh, bottom of the screen there. And if anyone is interested in, in the paper, do please uh, drop me a line. I'm happy to uh, happy to send it on if you would uh, if, you have, if you would like to, to have a look at that. So continuing with um, with how it's going. Um, so as as well as getting lots of uh, biological material for molecular work, so lots of tiny frog toes, as I've said, um, from really tiny frogs. Um, I also collected geographic data, so where point, waypoints where I caught and collected frogs, uh, and also where I heard frogs calling, and maybe not necessarily collected them from, from that particular point, but um, I did record where I was hearing frogs vocalising, and I made extensive recordings of their vocalisations. 
And one thing during the field work that, that struck me was um, the stark difference between the um, island of Pralin and the islands of Mahe in Silhouette, both in terms of their environmental conditions. So Pralin Island, this island here, is much lower at 367 metres of the highest elevation, but it's also drier um, and there's habitat on, on Pralin which um, isn't really characteristic of the habitat of the higher elevation habitat that you find um, on Mahe in Silhouette. So Mahe gets up to 905 metres and Silhouette up to 740 metres. So there's um, ecological differences uh, between uh, Pralin and uh, Silhouette and Mahe islands. But why were no other zoglossids uh, present on Pralin? And, and perhaps more significantly, why were Seychellensis frogs um, the only zoglossids that we currently find uh, today on Pralin? And this got me thinking about um, climate change and historic climate change and why these patterns might uh, uh, might be seen, how, how they might have brought about that the patterns that we see in the, in the uh, current geographic spread of where these uh, where these frogs are found. So after completing my PhD research and armed with the data that I had already collected uh, and further determined uh, to georeference any other records that I could get my hands on. So I, I mentioned in my introductory slide about the partners involved in the project and um, a chap uh, by the name of Ron Nussbaum um, had collected uh, hundreds and hundreds of, uh, of zooglossids uh, and um, other Seychelles uh, amphibian and reptile fauna um, in the 70s and 80s. And I went through um, uh, his records at the uh, uh, University of Michigan Museum of Zoology and geo-referenced uh, all of those data to try and build up the, uh, the maximum coverage I could get for geographic representation of where I was finding the frogs. Just as a, a, a quick aside to that, I mentioned Gardneri was thought to be one of the world's smallest frogs. This is uh, a, a baby Gardneri. So this is a frog which is literally just hatched out of, out of an egg. So Gardneri have a slightly different um, uh, developmental pattern. So the whole process of their development as from tadpole to froglet takes place in the egg rather than the tadpole breaking out and going onto the back of the female. And this is uh, a garden area next to my um, next to my finger there. That's a little little baby one that's probably not that long um, hatched out hatched out of an egg. I have no idea how I spotted it, but I managed to spot it and managed to get a, get a photo. So uh, uh, very cool findings, especially when you think that you know that's got lungs, eyes, heart, kidney, everything that we have in this tiny, tiny package, no bigger than a grain of rice, really. Anyway, so uh, first we looked at, thinking about the, going back to the geographic uh, data, first we looked at um, elevational distribution. Um, and as you might expect, praline frogs are found at lower elevation on praline because well, it's lower. Uh, there is no opportunity for upslope dispersal. However, they are also um, frequently found in the, the lower elevation habitat and not just the highest points. And despite there being ample lowland habitat that's broadly comparable for Seychellensis frogs on Mahe and also on Silhouette, the fro Seychellensis frogs on Silhouette and Mahe aren't established at these locations at these elevations and neither are any other of the zooglossid taxa. You may have the odd record but they're not established there. So this is kind of suggesting that frogs on praline um, haven't shifted their spatial distribution in response to, um, to warmer conditions, that they've actually become specialised to those, uh, those warmer conditions on, on the island of praline. So thinking about um, activity patterns, um, frogs on Pralin are crepuscular. Seychellensis frogs on Mahe and on Silhouette are also crepuscular. Um, and their vocal behavior, so carrying on the, very loosely I know, but carrying on the sounds theme, Seychelles sounds and science, um, although not, not anything to do with, uh, with DJing in nightclubs. I haven't, I haven't tried, to, uh, I didn't ever try to bring, uh, bring frog calls into, any of my sets, I don't think it probably would have worked very well. But um, so their vocal behaviour um, is also um, is also different, and and it follows some of the patterns that we might expect from being active at warmer temperatures. So um, longer calls, uh, and we see this in uh, an increase in the number of pulses which we 
uh, which we can detect in the cores. So praline frogs um, have not shifted their temporal behavior from crepuscular to nocturnal either. So you might expect if they're crepuscular on silhouette, crepuscular on mahe, if praline is warmer and the areas in which they're active on praline is warmer, they might actually shift their, their main activity periods to nocturnal, say, um, because it's, uh, you know, there's greater humidity and the temperature is a little bit cooler, but they haven't done that either. So this is a really important thing uh, also to note because there's an absence of um, zooglossid competitors uh, on praline. So um, Gardeneri, for example, are pro uh, predominantly um, diurnal. Tomasetti um, are nocturnal. So as well as um, not shifting in response to, um, uh, to any, um, any temperature related uh, patterns, they're also not shifting uh, in response to a lack of potential competition from, from other frogs. They've, they've just maintained that, um, that crepuscular, crepuscular period um, of, of activity. So ordinarily you might think there might, might be kind of uh, a separation of activity between, between the species, but, but this doesn't seem to have had an influence thus far, at least on these frogs uh, that, are, that are currently found on praline. So further using the elevational data, um, we performed what's called an ancestral state reconstruction across uh, all of the four currently recognized species. And what we found was that the ancestral zooglossid niche was likely to have been cooler to mid uh, high elevation habitat. Um, and this is providing further evidence that frogs on praline likely having historically been forced into occupying a warmer thermal niche due to, for example, um, historic global sea level rise, um, that they've adapted to these warmer conditions in the absence of any opportunity for upslope dispersal. And to add a little bit of um, context for that, over the past one million years, global sea levels have fallen to more than 60 metres below, present on at least 14 separate occasions and have remained so for periods of tens of thousands of years. And these events, these sea level uh, drops, would have reconnected all of the Seychelles islands. Um, and then the subsequent, so, so Mahe and Silhouette and, and, and Praline would have all been connected as part of one, one landmass. If you recall, I said uh, it's a former microcontinent which sits about 50 metres below sea level. So sea level drops, all of these islands have been connected. And over a period of a few thousand years, you could have the, um, the establishment of mature rainforests across these reconnected sections of, of the Seychelles Plateau. And this could, could actually provide repeated opportunities for dispersal uh, and gene flow across this emergent, uh, emergent plateau. And also importantly to this, we were also able to generate the first divergence uh, estimates for each, uh, for each island uh, lineage, as you can see from the scale at the bottom here in, uh, in millions of years, for, so from zero to 36 million years. So there's zooglossid ancestor, uh, the, or the, the ancestor of moderns, modern, modern zooglossids, zooglossids, we can uh, kind, of, kind of estimate goes back to uh, about 36 uh, million years uh, with, uh, with the um, uh, Zoglossus genus um, round about um, 20 or so uh, million years ago and Sashella fry and the other two smaller frogs um, round about um, 16 or so uh, million years ago. So as well as uh, differentiation in mitochondrial DNA, we looked again, uh, which we looked again at, um, we also looked again at the nuclear DNA uh, genotypes. And when we consider these together, uh, the, the uh, genomic uh, and bioacoustic differentiation we observed, so I've mentioned earlier about higher pulse rates, um, suggests that these frogs, these different populations of frogs have been separate, separated for uh, a length of time um, long enough for these changes to occur. Uh, and what that is actually suggesting um, is that at least on, on praline, we need to do further work on with, with Mahe and Silhouette frogs, but at least on praline, this could, uh, could well indicate um, a speciation event. So, so we're actually observing divergence and speciation um, in these frogs. 
So overall, um, frogs forced to occupy warmer, uh, a warmer island have seemingly adapted uh, by shifting their thermal niche. So they haven't become extinct, like potentially other, other, the other zooglossids may have done. Um, they've been able to remain uh, in a, in a uh, what might be a, a Goldilocks zone of some description for, uh, for Zyglossus sechulensis, but they've been able to, to, to adapt by shifting their thermal niche. And this is really providing a relatively rare but positive example of climate adaptation from a surprising source, small little brown frogs on an oceanic island. Secondly, this adaptation appears to have driven a speciation uh, level event, and we're continuing the work, uh, work on that at the moment. Um, a really important take home is that really highlighting that we can use empirical data um, to infer historic warming events. So we have all these different data types. We've got mitochondrial DNA, nuclear DNA. We've got um, vocal signatures, vocal analysis. We've got elevation data. We've got other georeference data. And we can put all of this information together within a, within a framework and use that to, to potentially um, infer not only historic warming events, but also um, to potentially predict um, climate impacts in climate vulnerable organisms as ectotherms uh, tend to be or gen generally thought of. So ectotherms being, um, yeah, amphibians, insects, and a whole host of, uh, of other taxa. But generally, generally speaking, the majority of ectotherms you're going you're to come across uh, are going to be amphibians, reptiles, uh, and insects. But the work hasn't stopped there. So we, what we really want to find out is if there is, if it's possible to identify a molecular basis for, for this upper thermal tolerance. So can we, can we detect signatures uh, in the genome for these frogs, which might be able to indicate um, if they have a, a, a thermal tolerance and by then actually be able to uh, potentially look at other related taxa and see um, see if we can see similar patterns there and, and possibly predict, as I mentioned previously, about predicting climate impacts, about predicting which taxa may be, uh, may be influenced and affected by, um, by such changes that we're, that we're currently experiencing and will be experiencing for, um, yeah, for all of our lifetimes at least. So uh, other things that have actually been happening. So yes, we've been able to do some um, do some interesting science and, and find out about um, climate change and, and what's happening with these frogs and possibly and for other stuff. But um, we've been able to instigate the first um, passive acoustic monitoring program in Seychelles for for amphibians. In fact, to my knowledge, for uh, for any any taxa. Um, and also uh, monitoring any any patterns of environmental change. So um, we received funding from uh, from MBZ and also support from uh, from all of these uh, organisations who've been working with, and we've deployed um, passive acoustic uh, monitoring devices, these song meters. Um, we've also been um, detecting um, uh, temperature and relative humidity. Um, and these devices have been spread out across the islands and are providing us with, uh, with wonderful data sets with which to actually uh, track and monitor activity uh, and see if we can uh, ultimately uh, link that with, uh, with in environmental patterns and any changes uh, in, in environmental patterns. We've, we've un under uh, lots of work on that uh, in that regard is, is, uh, is underway um, at the moment. Um, in addition, um, we've been able to um, actually contribute more uh, more broadly. So, um, as part of um, at the adaptation fund um, run by um, GEF and UNDP, and also um, other organisations uh, across Seychelles, so working with Seychelles government, um, we undertook um, vegetation surveys, aquatic surveys. Um, looking at all sorts of um, different taxa, so from the frogs to, to Sicilians, which are legless amphibians, for anyone unfamiliar with Sicilians. Parrots, there's a parrot, uh, a critically endangered a parrot species in Seychelles. And we've been able to, um, uh, to work with uh, a variety of local organisations to inform 
um, uh, management plans to to combat climate change. And this particular project was was about minimising the risk from uh, from fire by um, enhancing um, water catchments, basically, so fire could be uh, could be uh, dealt with appropriately if it breaks out on uh, on this particular island. And this was uh, specific to Pralin. Um, and Pralin is very special because uh, it's a, a remnant in the centre of Pralin. It's a national park and also a World Heritage Site. Um, and it's a, it's a palm forest. It's, it's unique. And if anything happened there, um, uh, and fire is a very real risk, um, it would be uh, difficult to uh, to counteract uh, and fight the fire while it was actually happening. So there's work underway to uh, to work out how to um, how to mitigate the the effects of fire should that actually take place by enhancing uh, areas of, of water catchments. And we were able to play a key role in that, um, specifically looking at uh, amphibians, but also extending that to um, to other biodiversity. So with um, kind of come full circle so um obviously i didn't invent the uh, the scientific poster i i <laughs> i invented that for myself um but uh it, you know it started it started pretty well uh and it's it's going pretty well so uh, um yeah we're kind of now at the end which is also the beginning and th this this is something i actually found um, not that long ago, and it, and it reminded me really how my whole kind of journey started. And this is me, uh, not that long ago, um, yeah, coming out of a of a cave in Seychelles with a frog in my hand. Hopefully, be able to um, to do that again at some point in the, in the not too distant future. So, um, but again, what's 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 really important is is the stuff in the middle, um, and what's happened, and and. Uh, you know, I've I've been I've been really fortunate, and I definitely haven't followed a traditional journey into academia. And, and I think it's Im important to point out that it's never too late to change, uh, and you you can do something you can do something completely different. Um, and uh, yeah, I think uh, I think that's about it. Apart from um, this guy. There we go. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for listening. Uh, and I'm uh, yeah, very happy to, uh, to take questions, uh, have a discussion. Yeah, good. Thanks, Jim. That was fascinating. Um, some really interesting stuff there. Um, and thanks again for taking the time to talk to us today. Um, as I said, some, some really interesting research and ongoing research too. Um, with some extremely interesting findings there. So um, I will open the floor now to anyone who has any questions. So you can either type in the Zoom chat, you can unmute um, and ask a question directly, or you can even type in the Facebook comment chat as well if you're watching on Facebook, and I'll try and keep an eye on that as well. So you can raise your hand if you've got a question that you want to ask out loud. Otherwise, as I said, please go ahead and type something. So while I let people consider that, um, I've obviously got some of my own questions for you too, Jim. Yep. Um, first of all, I, I think it's a, a great idea to incorporate frog noises into future DJ sets. I definitely think <laughs> you said it wouldn't be uh, popular. I think there's a huge niche for that, all of those. Yeah. I possibly have to put, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, if I put some beats behind it, I'm sure that yeah, would be okay. I don't just yeah. mean club noises. Yeah, but, um, yeah. yeah, particularly maybe student club nights or something. There. <laughs> There's definitely a need for that. Um, but anyway, uh, so in terms of some of your own re research there, uh, I'm particularly interested in, um, so you said about modelling future climatic impacts um, and talked about sort of the size of some of those thermal niches um, of the two glossids. So given what we know with sort of current um, climatic models, is it likely to affect the range of some of these species, um, given that there's not a huge amount of sort of elevational space available to them? So, yeah, so, so long term, what, what might happen there? 
that that is that is a real uh, a really important question and a real um, challenge. Uh, I mean, literally, they could be pushed off the top. So Zaglossus thomasetti, so the sister species to Sechelensis, um, is generally restricted to to the much higher um, elevations on Mahe and Silhouette. Um, you very rarely find them much lower than maybe 300 meters. Um, more often than not, they're, they're, they're higher than that. Um, so uh, the impact of, of climate change and rising temperatures mean that temperatures will mean that they'll, they'll, they'll literally get pushed a bit higher. So the current elevational range uh, and the temperature within their, their elevational range will shift. So they're available um, uh, the, their available habitat will become much more squeezed. If that continues, they could literally be be pushed off the top. Um, so that's a real uh, that's a real concern. Um, trying to um, trying to determine whether that could happen is something that we might be able to do. I'm, 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 I'm keen to pursue to see if we can identify uh, anything uh, that, that from the um, from the zooglossid genome um, that might give us an idea of what it, you know. If there's a particular aspect of the genome that which can which suggests there is um, a, a thermal tolerance, um, we could potentially then identify that in in uh, Zuglossus thomasetti. So with Zuglossus thomasetti and Zuglossus sechelensis, their sister sister species, so so closely related. And if we find a, a pattern in uh, sechelensis, that could hold also for thomasetti. It could also hold for other Zuglossids. It could also also hold for other um, other at risk task, taxa. And by having that knowledge, we would then be, be able to say. Um, or potentially to say, okay, we do need to focus on, um, you know, some some mitigation, or we need to work out what if there is any is anything we can do to stop these frogs literally from being sort of pushed up off the top. I mean, to be able to stop climate change might be uh, a bit of a challenge, um, but also stopping these frogs being pushed off the top is also a bit of a challenge. But they're probably very different in terms of scale um, but having some idea of what we might be able to do um, from understanding some of these uh, these potential traits uh, could be uh, could be really helpful in, in, in determining determining those sort of conservation um, efforts okay thanks a long answer to a short that was question. a very long answer a very interesting answer <laughs> uh, definitely answered my question so thanks um, and in the meantime plenty of other questions have now popped up oh, so okay. Um, starting with a question from Emma, um, what, why do frogs call for longer in warmer temperatures in this case? Um, so it's, it's more likely a combination of warmer temperatures and, and humidity. So if, if you think um, if it's been a really hot day and you walk outside your house, uh, I'm, I'm very broadly generalising here and making a, a, an interesting uh, analogy but it's a really hot day you go outside and you shout and shout and shout and very quickly you will become hoarse uh, your voice will change your vocal cords will dry up uh, it'll become much more difficult to make a decent decent sound um, if you go out at 2 a.m it's much more humid um, you'll be able to shout for longer with a with a with a less dry throat and be able to make yourself heard for a, for a longer period. So that, those are the sorts of um, physiological effects that, that the environment can have on, uh, on the vocalizing behavior of, uh, of, of the frogs. So basically they, they, can, be, they can be restricted in, in, in better conditions. Uh, they're much more able in, uh, to make uh, longer and more complex uh, vocalizations, broadly speaking. Cool. The answer. Starting to push your knowledge now beyond genetics to frog physiology, climate modelling. Um, let's see what else we can ask. Um, so, um, from Jessica, another question in the Zoom chat here that says, 
Is there much health data on the amphibians in the Seychelles, e.g. presence of chytrid? Um, and are there biosecurity measures slash policies in place to protect the isolated species? Great question. So one of the main considerations uh, from the point at which um, I started my work with colleagues in the Seychelles is, uh, was chytrid there? Is chytrid there? What's the situation? So um, to the best of my knowledge, when we last checked, it's not there. Um, however, it is a real, it's a real problem. Um, we don't know, for example, how uh, zyglossids or, or any of the Sicilians, which are also endemic, we don't know how they may or may not react um, to chytrid. Uh, worst case scenario, it arrives there and uh, infects everything and all zyglossid amphibians are, are wiped out. Best case scenario, it gets there and uh, none of that happens and they don't seem to, it doesn't seem to bother them. If, if you, I won't go into too much about chytrid, but there can even be differences between populations of, um, of species that have actually been um, uh, subject to, uh, to infection of chytrid. So there could be species differences. Some are vectors, some are asymptomatic vectors. I'm sure the current, <laughs> current backdrop we're all living in, we all, we all know what asymptomatic can, uh, and, uh, and all of those uh, sort of biosecurity questions kind of mean now. Um, so yeah, we don't, we don't know what would happen if, if, uh, if BD got there. In terms of biosecurity measures, we are regularly um, screening amphibians. So any work we do out there, we've been we've been screening amphibians uh, and uh, just trying to do uh, testing as best we can. There are biosecurity measures and policies uh, in place, um, and uh, but as with policies and procedures globally, it's the enforcement of those. On the plus side, um, people, the biggest risk is uh, from people spreading. Uh, the BD, and um, uh, it's it's no uh, no less a, a problem in in Seychelles. The thing is, in Seychelles, the areas generally speaking that people go into, um, or the or the sorry, it's tourists generally that are moving around the islands are more likely to be able to you know spread uh, material. Uh, disease on their footwear by their sort of general day-to-day -day activities. People aren't generally going into the areas where the frogs are. So there's, there is a uh, kind of a little bit of a, of a, uh, a safe barrier there. Maybe not barrier is not the right word, but it, people aren't interacting with, the, with, with the areas in, in which the frogs and Sicilians um, are found generally. The issue is that, that, that there is uh, an introduced frog which is found in the lowlands, which we don't really know yet whether it is uh, an asymptomatic vector or could potentially be a symptomatic vector for BD. And if BD got into that population, there's overlap. So these frogs at lower elevations, there's also tree frogs in Seychelles, not zyglossids, but tree frogs. So sometimes their habitats overlap. So if BD got to these lower level populations of the introduced frogs, that could conceivably be linked to the tree frogs, and then the tree frogs overlap with some of the areas in which you find zyglossids. So there could be like a stepping stone um, effect, and that's 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 a big uh, that's a big concern. Cool, excellent answer. Um, so a few more questions um, in the chat, um, a few messages of thanks to saying excellent talk. Uh, so Thank another you. question <laughs> from uh, or a question from Virginia here that says, are frogs particularly good for studying climate change or are there similar species, even plant species that could perhaps be studied in tandem? Um, I, I think probably looking at, um, okay. So quite often you, you'll hear about amphibians and also other tech, other 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 taxi, other taxa, other groups of species that they are the canaries in the coal mine, or you know that they're good for indicating this, or they're good bioindicators. There are a wide variety of individual um, taxonomic groups, species um, that could be good for that. 
um, but it doesn't hold true um, for, for everything. So I wouldn't say that frogs in particular are good at studying climate change, but some frogs might be because they do respond in a certain way to changes in, in the environment. Um, so providing you, you know, you select the taxa that you want to work with, you select the frog groups that you want to work with uh, in, a, in a considered way, you could answer some of those questions. Um, yeah, there's a variety of, of similar species and, and it's really one of the big challenges we have. It's not necessarily saving um, or protecting individual species. We're thinking about communities and the importance of those communities in a given environment, in a given ecosystem. Um, and as we know that, you know, they're all interlinked in one way, shape or form. So, um, Virginia, your, your suggestion about studying things in tandem and, and even expanding more broadly, I, I think is probably um, a, a much better approach to, to, to really understanding what's going on. Because also if you're focusing, focusing on one particular group, your questions or the answers to your questions may well be limited just to that group unless they are an appropriate proxy for everything else. So that's why you need to choose the, the groups that you're working on with uh, working with um, very, uh, very carefully. Cool, brilliant. Um, so there are just two more questions at the moment, but more could pop up, we'll see. Um, so uh, another question, um, this one from Kane says, hi, Jim, fantastic talk. My question is, um, this is going to test some of my own, my own pronunciation here and see whether I was listening. Uh, <laughs> do, do you have enough data to confidently label the, the Pralin um, Suglossid um, Seychellensis population as a separate species slash subspecies? And if not, um, would you still need to do, uh, so what would you still need to do to do this? Um, and does that distinction have important conservation implications for those populations? Okay, I'll, I'll start with the end bit first, the conservation implications. So they're currently recognised as one species, but we now know at the very least, each island population of Seychellensis is an evolutionarily distinct lineage. So if you're familiar with some of the um, uh, some of the literature, you'll often see um, see reference to things like um, OTUs, so operational taxonomic units, or ESUs, evolutionary significant. I forgot what the U is. <laughs> unit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, so evolutionary significant unit, and clearly each population, not just of Seychellensis, but also of Tomasetti and Gardineri, are evolutionarily significant units. So that that definitely has conservation implications because we're not talking about um, one, well, we are talking about currently one, one species when you look at each species, but each population of those species um, is on a different evolutionary pathway and they are distinct from each other. Um, so, uh, yeah, thinking about funding, how much, you know, how much money do you have and where do you focus it? Um, which population do you focus on? Do you split it between the three? Do you split it between two? Do you focus on one? How do you how do you do that? I should have also added um, that they are edge species, so evolutionarily distinct and globally endangered. If anyone's familiar with um, um, yeah ZSL's uh, edge program, um, they are all listed uh, there as well. Um, when it comes to species and subspecies, we are working on that um, at the moment. We have the, the the tools that we need, so we've got the genetic uh, information. We've got the um, uh, the vocalization information that we need, um, and uh, we also have this, uh, as I mentioned, more you know, the last paper that we had out, um, this um, ancestral uh, state recon reconstruction, looking at um, uh, the uh, ecological niche of, of the frogs. So we're currently um, we're currently looking at that at the moment. So um, watch this space; there will be something coming out about that uh, about that soon. But we're we're still working on that. So we need, so we need to uh, look out for a Suglossid Lebiskiensis or something in the future. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, 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 so first of all, I, I, if you describe, if it does turn out to be, be a new species, you don't describe it, you don't name it after yourself. Um, so uh, don't anyone get any fancy ideas about doing that. Uh, but we just don't know yet. 
um, we've still got work to do and um, yeah that's 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 currently underway but uh, yeah we shall we shall see but there'll be clarification as to exactly where uh, to where they stand. Brilliant looking forward to uh, to seeing that come out. Um, so final question um, and then release everybody because I'm sure everyone's got dinners to eat and places to be. Uh, so um, this one's from Barbara. Um, it says, great talk, Jim. Thanks. Uh, you mentioned differences in call frequencies among populations. Um, is there any other acoustic features, e.g. call phases, that could suggest the presence of population-specific vocal dialects? Um, potentially. Uh, so and this is where uh, amphibian calls can be tricky. Um, so they vocalize predominantly, uh, or one of the predominant reasons why they vocalize is um, for reproductive activity. So the males are vocalizing uh, and they are trying to, trying to attract a female. The female, possibly by the vocalization, possibly by the vocalization plus some other characteristic, it could be where the male is calling from. And if, if she thinks is, his sexy scrape in the earth is a okay. Um, she will select that that individual. It, it's really really difficult to identify if there are individual call characteristics for a given frog. So what makes this frog different from this frog? They're the same species, making the same call why is one more attractive to a female than another or what is differentiating those calls so it that that presents um a real challenge in understanding the why behind um you know differences uh in in calls and what makes them what's makes what makes them attractive and then factoring in if we look at sort of calls between two different islands uh, they sound superficially the same, um, but there could be um, other differences inherent in that vocal signature um, that that differentiate the two two pop two or more populations, whether it's Tomasetti, Gardineri, or Sessilensis. Um, and you need to have enough material to be able to do that. You can't just look at a couple of calls from one island and a couple of calls from another island and go oh yeah i've i've counted x number of pulses in one call and oh, it's a different number of pulses in the call from the other island you have to think about the environmental conditions so the, the question earlier about about different yeah different conditions and the analogy i made about going out into the street and shouting you know is, is that a difference because the environmental conditions are, are a little bit different or is it different because Hey, I'm Jim, and I shout differently in the street at 2 a.m. to Sam, who shouts differently in the street at 2 a.m. You'd probably be able to tell the difference between us, uh, <laughs> but uh, with, but with frogs, it's uh, it's much more difficult. So that was another long answer to a relatively short question, which possibly didn't actually answer it completely, but kind of with a bit of a don't know really, possibly, meh. <laughs> 